let's start with a definition. Uh, what is individualized medicine? So I'm taking, I'm paraphrasing Francis Collins' uh, definition, you all know Francis, that it's most basic personalized medicine refers to using information about a person's genetic makeup uh, to tailor strategies for the detection, treatment, and prevention of disease. Now I would agree completely with that definition, except I take issue, as you might have gathered, with the word personalized, which is much, uh, you, much very widely used. So let me, I always take advantage of these opportunities to explain why it should be individualized rather than personalized. So uh, let's just look at the definition of the terms. Uh, personal has two definitions, if you look it up in the dictionary. One is relating to someone's private life, intimacy. And the other is relating to one person, a particular individual. Now anyone who's had a pap smear or their prostate palpated knows that medicine has always been personal. An MD is a license to be personal. We ask questions that no one else asks. We touch patients in ways that no one else does. So medicine has really always been personal. What we're talking about is a new kind of medicine that is really individual. So I would argue for this reason and other reasons that we should use the term individualized medicine, a particular person distinct from all others in our thinking about our patients. Now, uh, why now? Why would we consider uh, this kind of thinking uh, now. First of all, modern medicine, medicine of the last uh, the 20th century since the Flexner Report, uh, has had tremendous successes. And I'm speaking really of medicine in the industrialized world. So we've had a prolongation of lifespan, improved quality of life. Uh, so there's no question that medicine as it's practiced now has been enormously successful. On the other hand, uh, there are ongoing concerns. Uh, many diseases are increasing in incidence. Uh, there's an unacceptable frequency in our hospitals of adverse events. As many as 5 to 10 percent of patients have an adverse event at some point. Uh, I don't have to say anything about it increasing expense. We all know that's a big problem. And if you ask patients uh, what they want in their physician, it's amazing. You get almost uniformly two criteria. One is they want their physician to be smart. But the other is they want their physician to be care, to care for them, to be interested in them, to think of them as an individual, not some uh, machine on a, a conveyor belt that goes through the medical office. Uh, okay, so another way to think about this is to put it in the context of a disease, and I'll mention one that I'm sure we'll hear from, from Fred, uh, which is type 2 diabetes. It's increasing incidence. It's almost epidemic in the world right now. And it's, uh, uh, it's tied, intertwined with the similar increase in um, obesity. And I'll, come back, I'll mention a word about obesity a little bit later as well. It's a chronic illness with an array of complications, microvascular and um, uh, macrovascular. And microvascular manifests itself in the retina with retinal artery disease in the limbs with sensory neuropathy due to impaired circulation to the nerves, and so you get these big ulcers, this is a, the heel of a patient with ulceration all the way to the heel bone, or macrovascular, this is a cross-section of a coronary artery, and you'll notice there's no hole in the middle, that's always a problem when you don't have a hole in the middle of your coronary artery. So um, suppose you had a relative who was newly diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, would you want your relative's patient, your loved one's patient, to tell you what the average outcome is for that patient, what the average complication rate is for that patient, or would you want the physician to tell you what are the problems that your loved one is going to face, what are the individual risks for your loved one, and what are the individual manifestations of that disease that your loved one may be more at risk for or less at risk for. So that's the goal, to be able to think in terms of the individual patient rather than all patients in general. So that brings me to, to sort of uh, the way I would, two, two characteristics of modern medicine that I think individualized medicine will change. So the first we're sort of already leading up to, which is what I call average medicine. Now by that I don't mean, here it is, uh, by that I don't mean uh, average in a pejorative sense. I mean average medicine in that in medical school we're taught to think of the classic patient, the classic case. And pretty soon that classic case mentality begins to make you think that all patients with a particular diagnosis are exactly alike. Um, <clears throat> so uh, if you see a patient like this, let's say, and this is a patient that I saw, and then uh, the sister, and they have a genetic syndrome. 
So the way it used to be was that you would take a history, a family history and so forth, examine the patient, get some blood tests, x-rays and so forth, and then you put all those features together and you try to make a diagnosis. And typically what happened would be that the person with the grayest hair in the room would make a pronouncement, this is what the patient has, and then in thinking about that patient, overtly or covertly, our thinking would be constrained to the diagnosis, not to the patient. What, is, what, what do we expect for the average patient with that diagnosis? Not what do we expect for this particular patient. So uh, the other uh, general feature of modern medicine is what I call trial and error medicine. And this is the way good physicians practice um, it, it, uh, right now. And that is, once you have a diagnosis, a patient, you make a diagnosis in a patient, then you say, okay, what, am I gonna, what medicine am I going to apply for this? What am I going to give this patient? I'm going to give them the medicine that most often works for this diagnosis. And if it's a good physician, they will make appropriate measurements, start the medicine, and have the patient come back at some interval, repeat the measurements, and ask, with my perturbation, has the patient gotten worse, better, or stayed the same? <coughs> and if the patient is better, great. If the patient stayed the same or is worse, then I'm going to stop that medicine and try another one, go through the whole exercise again. I'm going to do that over and over again until I get to what seems to be the right medicine for that patient. Now, wouldn't it be far better if we could make a set of uh, determinations at the outset and say it's much more likely for, you, for this individual patient that this combination of medicines is the appropriate uh, combination for this patient rather than going through this uh, uh, trial and error purpose or uh, process. So this is not a new idea, the concept that each patient is different. Uh, the experienced physician typically knows that no two patients are alike. The way medicine goes now is we take, teach the students that the patients are all alike, and then they go out and practice, and after decades of practice they say, you know, every patient I see with this diagnosis is actually different. So what we would like to do is introduce that idea to medical students at the outset, and as much as possible, uh, figure out how we can characterize the individual strengths and weaknesses of our patients. Uh, <clears throat> the problem is here, and this is a statement by Oswe Temkin, who is a, a professor of the history of medicine at Hopkins. He said, there is no science of the individual, and medicine suffers from a fundamental contradiction. Its practice deals with the individual, while its theory grasps universals only. So we teach medical students about universals, but when they go out and who sits across from them? Uh, an individual patient. So what we want to do is under, have the medical students understand that when they see a population or a sea of patients one after another, that they just remember that each of these individuals in this population has his or, own, his or her own unique sampling of our species genetic endowment, as well as a unique history of in utero and development. You'll hear more from, about that from George, I'm sure, this afternoon. And a family with its unique constellation of uh, socioeconomic uh, variables. It's down the bottom. Uh, so those environmental variables will play a role in what, what ways uh, it, it will play a role in this person's health as he or she grows older. So what has changed? Why do we think that we can take medicine to this new level by practicing individualized medicine? Well, Steve has already mentioned one. A big change, a sea change, was the Human Genome Project. The sequencing technology that went in, into that, getting a reference sequence, now understanding the uh, variation about that reference sequence and so forth. <laughs> Uh, another uh, thing that's changed is really what I call whole genome sequence biology. As Steve said, we were sort of groping around in a dark room. It's interesting to remember that there was a lot of argument at the time the Human Genome uh, Project was being uh, planned about whether or not this would be a worthwhile endeavor. And there is now almost no one in the biomedical <coughs> sciences who does not want to have the whole genome sequence of her, his or her favorite organism, whether it's a fly, the worm, or whatever. You've got to have it. <coughs> um, an increasing prominence of evolutionary thinking in medicine. We used to think about evolution as being dinosaurs and fossils that have little to do with medicine. Increasingly, we realize that evolution is going on constantly. Natural selection is taking place as you're listening to me talk. And um, we have to, it, it really tells us why some people get sick and why some people don't. So we have to understand that and make sure our trainees understand. 